Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 3. And we'll get into our Bible study. And I'll just pray. Father, we just give you thanks this morning for your word. It's such a pleasure, such a joy. It's such soul food, Lord, to open it and to read it and to study it together. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, who leads us into all truth. And Lord, I pray that this morning you would just use me to speak the word of God and that our hearts would be open and our minds would be ready to receive what you have to speak to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. John, you know, is a book of evidences. He says at the end of the book that he wrote these things so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we may have life in his name. He wrote these things as evidences, the book of John. So if you give out a gospel of John to somebody, you're actually giving out a gospel tract. And he says, this is enough for a person to believe in Jesus Christ. And so what he does throughout the book is he brings evidences, signs, people who are testifying to who Jesus Christ is. Now today, we're going to get into the last part of chapter 3 which is John the Baptist's testimony about Jesus. Now, he's already testified once in chapter 1, but here we see in chapter 3 that he's going to testify the last time in the, in the book of John. And so this is his final testimony. He's brought up to the stand by the apostle John, and this is going to be the last time we hear from him. Now, looking at John the Baptist is an interesting study. You look at this guy. He is an excellent role model. In fact... Jesus said about him that no one born of woman has risen a greater prophet than John the Baptist. So you look at the guy's life and you think, wow, he is the greatest of all the prophets. All the prophets prophesied until John. So he's the last of the Old Testament prophets. And Jesus said he is the greatest one. And we'll find out today that he is the best man for Jesus at his wedding. You know, he's introducing the bride to Christ. But also we see in this passage the character of John the Baptist. We see some extraordinary things about his heart. He had a real heart for God. He had an understanding of truth. He understood his place before God too. So he becomes a great role model for each one of us. And so as we get into this, I'm going to give you, if you're a note taker, I'll give you an outline. It's a four-part outline. Number one is the petty jealousy of, of his disciples, John the Baptist's disciples. Number two is true humility of John the Baptist. Number three is Christ's majesty that John the Baptist speaks of. And number four is the believer's certainty that John the Baptist knew. So it goes like this. Number one, petty jealousy. Number two, true humility. Number three, Christ's majesty. And number four, the believer's certainty. So let's look at verse 22 of chapter 3. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now, it says that Jesus baptized, but actually we know from chapter 4, verse 2, we'll read it next time we're together, that it wasn't Jesus who actually baptized, but his disciples did the baptizing. So there he is. He's at the Jordan River. He left Jerusalem. He went there, and they started to baptize. It wasn't Jesus, but it was his disciples. Now John also was baptizing in Enon near Salim because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. So John the Baptist, you remember before in chapter 1, he was at a place called Bethabara, which was beyond the Jordan, as it says in the Bible, which means on the east side of the Jordan, on the other side of the Jordan from Jerusalem. Now he's in a place called Enon near Salim. Now that's on the other side of the Jordan, on the west side, the west bank. And he's up there baptizing because there's a lot of water there. So you have to have a lot of water to dunk people under. Okay, he didn't just sprinkle them, he, he dunked them down. And um, he was baptizing. So you can, you can imagine here, there are two groups of people being baptized. 
there's the group that's being baptized by John the Baptist, and there's a group that's being baptized by Jesus' disciples, and they're in separate locations, maybe a couple miles apart. Well, then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. So, when it says here, there's a dispute among the disciples of John and the Jews, it doesn't mean just any Jews. Usually when John refers to the Jews, he's referring to the leaders of the Jews. And specifically here, these Jews would have been Pharisees. We know that from chapter 4, verse 1. So, there's this dispute about purification. You see, the tradition for the Jews was that whenever they went to the temple and offered a sacrifice, or if a pagan was converted to Judaism, they would take a ritual bath, what was known as a mikvah bath. And if you go to Jerusalem today, and you go to the Temple Mount, you can see the ruins of all these mikvah baths all around the temple area. And so it was a very common thing. So the Christian church didn't introduce baptism. That was something they had before Christianity came along. But it took on a new meaning when Christ died, was buried, and rose again. So when a person now is baptized into Christ and becomes a Christian, they're baptized into his death, so to speak, buried, and then raised out of that water to new life in Christ. That's Romans 6, 4, by the way, which we'll work on. <laughs> new life in Christ because we've been raised from the dead. And so there's this dispute going on about this purification rite or tradition. And so the, the Pharisee or the Pharisees were probably saying, well, which baptism's better? Yours, John the Baptist, or this one that Jesus is doing down the river? You know, which one is more powerful? Which one is more effective? And maybe these Pharisees were saying, hey, you know what? Jesus down the river is baptizing a lot more people than John the Baptist is baptizing. And he's kind of provoking the disciples of John the Baptist to jealousy. Well, look what it says in verse 26. And so they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. Now this would probably be hyperbole or exaggeration. All are coming to him? Well, he's really speaking about this whole crowd that John the Baptist had been baptizing is now starting to lead John the Baptist to go to Jesus to be baptized. And you can see what he's doing, or, th or these disciples are doing. They're saying, Jesus, or sorry, John the Baptist, you're losing your people. You're losing your ministry to Jesus. This one that you testified about, I know you said he was the Son of God and everything, that he was the Lamb of God who takes away the, the sins of the world. But now, all of your people are leaving you and they're going to him. And you can see what they're thinking. You need to stop this, Jesus. Or stop this, John the Baptist. Don't allow Jesus to do this. Now, this is what we can refer to as petty jealousy. And we don't like to think that this stuff happens in churches, but petty jealousy does happen in churches a lot. And there are some things that we can get jealous about as Christians. Number one that I've listed here is ministry success. The disciples of John the Baptist saw the success of Jesus and they start to get jealous. You know, do something about this, Jesus. Everybody's going to him. Now, ministry success. Let me ask you a question. How would you define the success of a church? If you could just say, oh yeah, that's a very successful ministry or successful church. How would you define it? Would you say that numbers, the amount of people that go to that church, that would define success? Would you say the big building that they have or the amount of money that the church has, that defines success? Well, could be both of the, all of those things. It could be. But not necessarily. When Jesus wrote some letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation... He wrote one to the, the church of Sardis. And he said to them, You have a name to be alive, 
but you are dead. <laughs> he said, you know, on the outside you appear to be alive, but on the inside you're dead. There was a guy named Vance Havner, a, a preacher from the past. He said this, a church can have the bones of organization. It can have the body of a big membership. But if the Spirit of God is not moving in that church, it is a congregation of corpses. And you know what? That can absolutely happen. You can have a huge following. You can have a huge church, but on the inside, it's just dead. Well, what about money? What about buildings? Well, in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus wrote a letter to the church of Laodicea. And the Laodicean said, We're rich. We have need of nothing. We've got everything we need. They were relying on their money. If they had a building, they'd probably be relying on their building, their big projects. And he said, you say that. You say you're rich and have need of nothing, but don't you know that you are wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked? <laughs> That's an indictment. So it doesn't really matter how big your church is or how much money you've got. If the Spirit of God is not moving, then... It's a congregation of, of corpses. And so those things can be the measure of success, but it's not necessarily the measure of success. How does the Lord measure success? It's often not how we measure success. The Lord measures success on one criteria, that is faithfulness. If you are just faithful to do what God calls you to do as a servant of God, that's all he requires. Whether your church grows big, whether you get a lot of money, whether you have a building or not, it doesn't really matter. As long as you're faithful to do what God's called you to do. Jesus talked about when, in the end time, when, when the judgment comes and he's handing out rewards, that he will turn to those on his right and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Being faithful, just to do what God's called us to do. A couple years ago, um, I was frankly discouraged in the ministry because I came from a very big church. Um, uh, the church is the size of some small cities. And, uh, and I saw every week, I saw 40 or 50 people get saved. And so I'm plugging away. I, I have a heart to see people come to Christ. And I'm not seeing a lot of people come to Christ. And so in my discouragement, I wrote to my pastor, and I want to share with you just a part of, a, of the letter that he wrote back to me. He said, you are swimming against a very strong current of European postmodernism, and most churches have succumbed to it there. What was once a fairly pervasively evangelical climate is now just the opposite. But none of these people will be your ultimate critic on that final day when the Lord, our righteous judge, will hand you your crown. He cares not how many people came to hear you, but rather how faithful you were to those whom he entrusted you with. And you know, when I heard that, it just set me free. Because I look at my pastor, and I think that's a successful minister. And he's saying, don't worry about how many people come to hear you. Just do what God's called you to do, because in the end... You're going to stand before God to be rewarded on the basis of your faithfulness, not on the basis of numbers or money or buildings or whatever that is. So, this sets us free, doesn't it? So the church down the street can grow and people can get saved there and they can have a big building and everything and we can just clap and rejoice for them. Praise God for that. We don't have to get jealous. We don't have to worry about that. Praise the Lord. Just be faithful is what God is calling us to be. So we can get jealous of ministry success. We can also, as Christians, get jealous of spiritual gifts. You know, sometimes we think, oh, if I only had his gift, or if I only had her gift, then I could really, uh, you know, minister in the church, or I could do something for God, but I don't have anything to give. Do you know if you're a Christian, you have a gift that God's given you to give? Every Christian has at least one gift. And so we don't have to be jealous of other people's gifts. There are three places in the New Testament where God lists the spiritual gifts. Romans chapter 12, 
1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Ephesians chapter 4. And as you go through the list of these gifts, you notice something, that God loves variety. He doesn't just give one gift to everybody. He loves a variety of gifts. And all those variety of gifts are to work together so that the whole body is built up. And so if we all have gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit to us, and we all give the gift that we've been given, then everybody can receive a gift and the whole body grows up. Now, it says in 1 Corinthians twelve eleven, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So the Holy Spirit decides who gets the gifts. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe that God has the right to give anybody a gift that he wants to give? Okay, think about it at, at, at Christmas. You've got the right to give a Christmas gift to anybody you want to. And so God has the right to give a gift to any one of us at any time. And so if that's God's right then we don't have to worry if we don't have someone else's gift. We don't have to worry if God is using them more in the same gift that we have. We can just rejoice and say, praise God for that. And so we're free from it. And so I encourage you, use your gift. Find out what it is. If you don't know what your gift is, ask God to show it to you, and he will. And then just use it. One more thing that we can get jealous about. Leadership. We can get jealous about leadership. There's a story in Numbers chapter 16 of the sons of Korah. This is known in the New Testament as the rebellion of Korah. Well, the sons of Korah got together, and these guys, by the way, were Levites. They were in charge of doing some work for God. They were in charge of carrying uh, the Ark of the Covenant and some of the other instruments or implements of the tabernacle. So they had a very important job. But they looked at Moses and Aaron, and they were jealous of them. And this is what happened in Numbers 16. It says, The sons of Korah united against Moses and Aaron and said, You have gone too far. The whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord, and he is with all of us. What right do you have to act as though you are greater than the rest of the Lord's people? Who put you in charge? You know, you think you're something hot? You know, why do you get to do the leader the leadership, you know? Why? We're all of God's people, so we should all be leaders. And so they rebelled against God's authority, and God heard that and was upset with it, and he judged them. As a matter of fact, he told the rest of the Israelites, you need to get away from their tents. And the ground opened up and swallowed them and their families alive, right down into the pit. It was an extreme judgment on them. And then there were also these 250 other guys who were burning incense who were on their side, and they were burned. God judged them very severely. The Bible tells us in Psalm 75, verse 6, Exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. So, leadership... God just puts who he wants in leadership. And it's not something for us to be jealous about. You know, why does he get to do all that? Or why, you know, why is this? We can just be content with where we are in the body of Christ. And so that's the best for us. And it's the best for the church when we as Christians just bloom where God has planted us. When we just fulfill the ministry that God has given us to do, we don't have to be jealous. There's an author named Gail Irwin who wrote a classic book. If you've never read it, I encourage you to read this book. It's called The Jesus Style. And in this book, he, uh, he has a section about bringing up the rear. That's the, the title of the, the chapter. And in this chapter, it says, Nobody, nobody can survive with its parts competing against each other. A body is designed to be healthy when each part is doing its job in a thoroughly cooperative manner. Competition by its very nature is self-serving, the very opposite of the servant, self-giving nature of Jesus. 
If we love others the way Jesus does, we will rejoice so much in seeing them achieve and enjoy the position of being first that we will hardly notice that in our efforts to help them, we turned up last. This is the result of the totally others-oriented servant. The exciting question to ponder is, what would happen to the church if we all treated each other this way? Love is irresistible. I long for the world's commentary to once again be, my, how the Christians love one another. I was reading recently about the Tour de France. In the Tour de France, um, you know, they have the star riders like Lance Armstrong or Miguel Indurain or these other guys who are just the team leaders. But the guys who support them in the Tour de France are called domestiques, which means a helper. And their job is to totally lay their lives down, in the sense, so that the team leader can win. Now, one of these guys, who was Miguel Indurain's domestique, Indurain won the, the Tour de France five times. This guy was an amazing rider. He had, a, he had a resting heartbeat of 28 beats a minute. He's like a freak of nature. This guy was a real athlete. But one of his domestiques said this, and I, I find this really, really interesting when we're thinking about the jealousy aspect and stuff in competing. He said, when you have the chance to start your career in so big a team and at the side of a champion as great as Indurain, you grow in the service of sacrifice. Now, I don't know if this guy's a believer or not, but listen to these words. You grow in the service of sacrifice. I don't complain. On the contrary, I had the chance to live some wonderful moments. When Indurain won, or another rider for whom we had decided to work, it was a victory for all the team men as well. And when I heard that, I thought, that is just the way it should be in the body of Christ. Our champion, Jesus Christ, is going to win the race. And we're the domestiques. You know, we domestique, we help Jesus to win the race. And when he wins, the whole team wins. So we just lay our lives down, we just accept our position as a domestique, as a helper, and we just ride for Jesus, so to speak. Well, these guys were jealous. And um, I want you to notice the response of John the Baptist. The character that comes out in his response to these disciples. Look in 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Now here's the first example of true humility. John knew that everything he had came from God. In Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar was up on his palace. He's walking around. And in his pride, he said, Is this not great Babylon that I have made by my own great power and might? And right at that moment, God said this, This kingdom is going to be taken away from you, and you're going to be driven out into the wilderness, into the fields, to eat the grass for seven years. And he said, Until you know that, the kingdom of, that God reigns in the kingdom of men and sets men in positions of power. He said, You know what? You don't understand that I put you there. And yet, in his pride, he was all puffed up. John the Baptist knew that everything he had came from God. Do you remember when Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate said, You answer me nothing? Don't you know that I have the power to crucify you or to set you free? And Jesus said, Unless it were given to you from above, you would have no power over me. You know? So all authority has been given by God. So John the Baptist had this knowledge that everything he had came from God. Verse 28. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but have been sent before him. Here's the second example of true humility. John the Baptist knew who he was, and he knew who he was not. He said, I'm not the Christ, but I'm just the forerunner of Christ. And so it's important that we also know who we are, and it's important that we know who we're not. Verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him 
rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. So here's the third example of true humility exhibited by John the Baptist. He was happy to simply serve Jesus. He was just happy as a servant. He called himself the friend of the bridegroom. Now, we would know that as the best man at a wedding. I'm excited because this summer, my little brother is getting married. And uh, he's asked me to be his best man. So I'm really excited about getting my best man speech ready and everything. Now, how would you feel about me if at my brother's wedding, as his beautiful bride is walking up the aisle, and there I am as the best man, I'm making eyes at my brother's fiance. Hey, how about you and me a little later on, you know? That would be just repulsive, wouldn't it? John the Baptist is not making Google eyes at the bride of Christ. He is rejoicing in the fact that when Jesus has come, that he is going to get his own bride, right? So he's not jealous at all. He's happy just to serve the Lord. The friend of the bridegroom in a Jewish wedding was responsible for making all the wedding arrangements, responsible for calling, calling guests to come, and for leading the couple to the bridal chamber so they could consummate their marriage. And so, you know, he's just excited that Jesus is going to get his bride. He rejoices in it. By the way, look at the, the life of John the Baptist from beginning to end. Do you remember when he was in Elizabeth's womb and Mary came with Jesus in her womb? And when Mary um, spoke and Elizabeth heard it, John the Baptist leaped for joy in her womb. And now, toward the end of his ministry, toward the end of his life, he hears the voice of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, and he leaps for joy. That's a great way to live, isn't it? Just listening for the voice of the Lord and just praising and rejoicing in his presence. Look in verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. And so here we see the fourth example of true humility in John the Baptist. He was content to get no recognition as long as Jesus got recognition. He was fading and Jesus was ascending. Now this is a key for every believer and every person who wants to, sh to serve God. Is that we've got to be content when Christ and others get the praise, the compliments, the limelight, and we don't. We've got to be content with that. R.A. Torrey wrote a, a little book called Why God Used D.L. Moody. And D.L. Moody is actually one of my heroes of the faith. R.A. Torrey said about him that of all the men who were born in the 19th century, he thought that D.L. Moody was not just the greatest preacher, but the greatest man who lived in that century. And, I mean, his work continues on to this day, his writings. We can say that also about C.H. Spurgeon, probably. But this is what he said. This is why God used D.L. Moody, one of the reasons. He said, Oh, how he loved to put himself in the background and put other men in the foreground. How often he would stand on a platform with some of us little fellows seated behind him as he spoke, and he would say, There are better men coming after me. And as he said it, he would point back over his shoulder with his thumb to the little fellows. I do, not now, I, I do not know how he could believe it, but he really did believe that the others that were coming after him were really better than he was. He made no pretense to a humility he did not possess. In his heart of hearts, he constantly underestimated himself and overestimated others. So we see here this example of true humility in John the Baptist, and this is what God wants to work into our lives, that he must increase, but I must decrease. Now you'll notice just as we move on, there are three musts in this chapter. There's the must of the sinner, you must be born again. There's the must of the Savior, the Son of Man must be lifted up from the earth. And then there's the must of the servant. He must increase, but I must decrease. So John the Baptist is exalting the Lord. Now, let's look in the next 
part of it in, in verse 31. And this is where we get into the third part, Christ's majesty. This is where Jesus is exalted by John the Baptist and his majesty declared. He who comes from above is above all. He who speaks, in, he who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. So John knew that what he spoke about God paled in comparison to what Jesus spoke about God. John could testify about God, but Jesus gave eyewitness testimony about God. He spoke of what he saw and heard. Now you can think about John the Baptist life being sort of like a lunar eclipse. John the Baptist was like the moon, but Jesus Christ was like the sun, and the sun eclipsed the moon. But John wasn't bummed out about that. He said, he must increase, I must decrease. Look in verse 33. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. So here in this passage, we see the deity of Christ. Christ speaks the words of God because Christ is God. Christ spoke with supreme authority because he spoke from heaven. Now, when we receive Christ's words, we receive God's words. So we affirm that God is true when we receive the words of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, the writer of Hebrews said, God, who at various times and in various ways in time past spoke through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. So Jesus Christ is the greatest revelation of God. When we receive the words of Christ, we actually receive the words of God and we affirm that God is true. Now notice one other thing in that passage. He says, that he does not give the Spirit by measure. The Old Testament prophets had the Spirit come upon them and then the Spirit would leave them. But Jesus had the fullness of the Spirit of God. It says in, in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 9, that in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in bodily form. Jesus was full of the Spirit like no man ever was full of the Spirit. So he doesn't give the Spirit by measure to his Son. Now verse 35 and 36. And here is, these are John the Baptist's final words in the book of John. And it speaks of our fourth uh, part of the outline, the believer's certainty. He says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So he's talking about the certainty of belief. When a believer trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, there's an absolute certainty of his salvation. Notice how simple it is. He says, he who believes in the Son. So a simple faith, just putting your faith in Jesus Christ, what he's done for you on the cross is enough to save a person. And notice how certain it is. He says, he has, meaning already has, everlasting life. The moment that a person receives Christ, often we think, I'm going to get everlasting life after I die. But actually, the moment that you receive Christ, you have it right there. And it is long life, yes, but it's also an abundance of life. It speaks of a quality of life. But notice also in here, there's a warning. There's a warning to unbelievers that if they don't believe, they will not see life. But the wrath of God just abides or remains on them. Look look over in, in verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So there's this condemnation that rests upon a person already who hasn't believed. 
So God comes along to a dying man and says, do you want to be saved? And if they say yes, then they can get in with Jesus and he will save them. But if not, then they're going to go along. They're going to suffer the wrath of Almighty God. Now, this means that if heaven is this close to a believer and we can just put our faith in Jesus and know that we're saved, hell is also very close to an unbeliever. In a flash, that unbeliever could be gone, separated from God forever, suffering in hell. So our eternal destiny rests upon what we do with Jesus Christ. If we receive him, we can be forgiven. And that's why the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now, do you remember what Jesus said about John the Baptist? He said, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But Jesus went on to say this, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So the moment that a person receives Christ, they're in the kingdom of heaven and they're greater than John the Baptist. Even though this man was a tremendous person, what a character. He was the best man. But we can be even greater as Christians. And so, you know, if you're a believer here today, I just encourage you to rejoice in your salvation, that you have everlasting life. Everything that you've ever done that's been sinful against God has been forgiven you. You're not going to come under judgment. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Everyone. Now, the devil's going to tempt you. He's going to accuse you for things that you've done in the past. But you've got this verse right here. These are the words of God. These are the truths of God. You can testify that God is true. You can say, when the devil tempts you, you know, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. I have it right now. I am saved. If you're not a believer here today, then I encourage you to come to Christ right now. Don't wait another day. Don't wait for your heart to get hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. But just be soft to God and say, yes, I believe, I receive, I want to be saved, and God will save you. And it's so simple that a child can do it, just believing in the Son. Why don't we... Um, why don't we close in prayer and then, Brandon, would you come up and just lead us in another song? And so, Father, we just want to give you thanks this morning for the gift of everlasting life in Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy to us. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to be jealous of other people. In the body, we don't have to be um, jealous of gifts or calling or of other churches or other things that you're doing in the world. Father, we can rejoice in what you're doing among us right here. We thank you for the example of John the Baptist, and we thank you, Lord, that you said, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And, uh, and Lord, we just give you praise this morning. Thank you, God. We just want to worship you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. <laughs> 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 